May it please the court. Your Honor, on the issue of damages, it's not my issue, but I would note that there are two Nobel Prize winners who have filed an amicus on behalf of the plaintiff class members supporting the plaintiff's theory of damages. And frankly, finding Dr. Viscusi's manner of damages and how he suggested damages should be calculated as improper. Mr. Power, for the record, will you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. We all know who you are, but there is a tape being made. Joseph A. Power, Jr., on behalf of the class. In respect to the other amicus that have been filed, we have the American Medical Association, American Lung Association, American Cancer Association, the Illinois State Medical Society, all in support of the judgment below and have suggested in their brief that this light cigarette matter is an urgent public health issue. In addition, the AARP and Trial Lawyers for Public Justice have filed an amicus in support of certification of this matter. The American Heart Association, among others, have also filed an amicus. The importance of this case and why the public health community is so interested in this case is they, too, were doomed. In 2001, they were recommending, up until the monograph 13 came out, that these so-called light, low-tar cigarettes, if a smoker could not quit, they should go over to the low-tar light cigarettes. And Dr. Burns, as Mr. Swego has said, was the editor and author of every Surgeon General report since 1975. And he testified in the record in this case, had he known what he knows now and what he learned after 1999, he would never have recommended that people switch from the regular cigarettes to low-tar cigarettes if they could not quit. And that's his testimony in this record. They, too, were defrauded. Unfortunately, the doctors were defrauded and their patients paid the price. There were doctors who also testified in the record in this case that they, too, recommended up until 2001 to their patients, if they didn't quit, clearly they wanted them to quit, but if you couldn't quit, switch to the low-tar light cigarettes. This all started in 1964, the record will suggest, and I would ask you to look at Mr. Coleman's testimony. So Mr. Coleman at the time was the president and CEO of Philip Morris Company. That's when the Surgeon General report came out, connecting up lung cancer with cigarettes. Of course, the Surgeon General was denounced, but at the same time, in this case, we learned that there was a letter from a Mr. Weissman to Mr. Coleman, saying that there was trouble in the wind and we needed to create a psychological crutch that we could keep smokers hooked on cigarettes and recruit new smokers. Mr. Coleman testified in this case, under oath, via deposition, that that psychological crutch was light cigarettes. At first, consumers disliked the taste of lights. That's what their internal documents show. That was overcome. The taste disadvantage was overcome with the false, fraudulent descriptors, light, low-tar, and nicotine. At that time, there's letters that were disclosed from 1999 that Mr. Coleman decided they needed to develop something out of the states so that it would be out of reach of consumers and the public health community. So what they did is they set up a laboratory in Cologne, Germany, called Invifo, and that's where most of their testing was done. Unbeknownst to any of the public, the Surgeon Generals, the FTC, the smokers, all this testing, the mutagenic testing, the precancerous testing, all were done in Germany. And it also is in the record in 1999, a letter was found where there's a Mr. Osden in Virginia. He said what they should do is communicate to him via telex, and then after he would get the testing, the mutagenic testing, the biogenetic testing, the tumorosity testing, after they got the results in Germany, they would telex it to him in Virginia, and he would review them and destroy them. And that evidence that Mr. Swedlo talked about of 22 of the 25 most toxic chemicals in a light cigarette, that was all hidden from the American public until 1999, when there's an MSA settlement and the Minnesota litigation was settled. And after that, 
The court compelled the production of documents which were hidden from the American public until that time, showing how reprehensible the conduct was of Philip Morris deliberately hiding this information from the American public while they hooked new smokers, including our children. In the end, this record will reflect, year in and year out, 440,000 people die from cigarette smoking. That is more American, it's in the record, more deaths per year from cigarette smoking than all the American soldiers killed in World War II. But the World claim II. here is not personal injury. It isn't, but this shows, this shows their conduct. This goes to the issue of why this judge, in this record, decided this way. Their conduct is an issue in this case in respect to punitive damages. It, it, they kill more Union soldiers, more, they kill more people per year than all the Union soldiers that were killed in, in the Civil War. The defense in this case, and this is all, all due respect to defense counsel, because these are outstanding lawyers. That is an outstanding firm. But I thought all the punitive damages were, were related to the misrepresentation. Well, in the fraud, Your Honor, this is a consumer fraud case, and this went to the degree of the fraud and the fraud in which they perpetrated upon the American public. And it also goes to the statute of limitations issue in respect they are claiming documents that they hid until the end of 1999 that somehow the consumer should have known that, in fact, the consumer was getting 22 of the 25 worst chemicals because of the ventilation issue, which they used to trick the FTC machine at the same time deliver the same amount of tar and nicotine. Unfortunately for the smoker, it was a worse tar and a worse nicotine. And that's, that's, the, that's the fraud. And when counsel would suggest to us that uh, somehow there is preemption in this particular case, and I look to, I'm blue in the face too, and I could never find a case in Illinois, nor find a, a federal case that would preempt falsity, fraud, deceit. And in particular, when he cited SIP alone, the SIP alone, there were four theories of liability. One was express warranty, that indeed express warranty isn't involved in this case, but in reference to uh, the other three theories, the one that was preempted was just negligence. The other theories of fraud, falsity, those particular theories were not preempted, and I would uh, ask this court to look at the, the United States versus Philip Nor Morris, that's note two, note, note seven, where they said, in fact, that the, the FTC needs help in matters like this. And because the FTC needs help, they, they invite actions such as this. And that's footnote number seven. In this particular case, in the record, and we talk about this was a, at first a cigarette package for women. And Mr. Morgan testified that 60% of the smokers are women of these cigarettes because women wouldn't smoke the red package with the Marlboro men. And in fact, there's been an epidemic, which, which Dr. Shields testified and Dr. Toon testified and Dr. Burns testified. There's been an epidemic in respect to adenocarcinoma, a formerly rare form of cancer. Now it's the, it's the largest uh, amount of lung cancer we have in terms of leading to death is adenocarcinoma because of the way they, these cigarettes deliver. You have to suck a little harder to get the smoke. The, the tar goes to the periphery of the lungs, and as a result of getting to the periphery of the lungs, it leads to the adenocarcinoma. In fact, there's 17 times more deaths to women from these cigarettes, 10 times more deaths to men from these cigarettes. Mr. And Power, let me interrupt you. It seems to me that most of your argument um, uh, is um, directed to health issues uh, and, and the smoking of a cigarette that customers or the consumers believe were better for their health. However, the complaint in this case is not is not seek, nor was a judgment based upon health issues. Rather, it was focused on economic damages. Well, there's, there's no question about that, Your Honor, but it went to the fraud because what Mr. Coleman, Mr. Morgan, and Mr. Melheiser, who were the CEOs and presidents of Philip Morris during this class period, each one of them testified that this was intended to represent, and they knew it represented to the consumer a healthier, a better cigarette. That's a safer cigarette. And that's the testimony in this record, unrebutted. 
The CEOs of their company said that the consumers perceived this as being safer and healthier for them, and that went to the front. Now, again, your time has expired, but the judgment in this case was premised on economic damages, was it not? Your Honor, it was, yes, but the fraud went to the health issue, that this was represented, and Philip Morris hierarchy understood that this, the consumer believed that this was a healthier, better cigarette for them, a safer cigarette, and it's replete in the evidence in this case. And, in fact, in this case, the plaintiff had epidemiologists, oncologists. We had an abundancy of the world authorities testifying on behalf of the class. In respect to Philip Morris, they had one witness who didn't say it's any safer, but said in his opinion that it wasn't more dangerous. That's what he said. Now it's more safer that it wasn't more dangerous, and, you know, you would think, well, was he an oncologist? No. Was he a pulmonologist? No. Well, what was he? He was a pharmacologist who used to work for Philip Morris, who was under contract with them to pay him $500,000 a year, terminable at will, if he didn't cooperate with them. That was their only witness, and I'm not a defense counsel. They are great lawyers. They did a wonderful job, but they had a terribly weak case. It was a terribly weak case, and as a result, all the experts that were testifying in this case, all the oncologists, epidemiologists, pulmonologists, the top people in the world in their field were all testifying on behalf of the class. And that's why we have all these amicuses in this case, because the doctors, the public health community was duped. And that's why — Mr. Power, let me interrupt you, okay? As I indicated, your time has expired. Because of the importance of the issues, I will give you two minutes to complete your argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. In respect to the presumption issue, there is no case, there is no case in Illinois and no case in the United States, and I've looked on bull in the face, too, that says there's an exemption for fraud, for falsity, for deception. There's no case in Illinois or the United States that there's preemption for fraud, for falsity. The chip alone was really a 7-2 decision, a 7-2, because three of the justices said that, indeed, in SIP alone, that there was no preemption at all. The other four justices said there was just preemption on the first theory, which was a negligence theory. That was it. This is a fraud case. SIP alone applies, and in chip alone, they said specifically that Congress did not intend to insulate the cigarette industry for fraud. And this is a fraud case. In reference to the Spreetsma case, Spreetsma is right on point because there's no implied preemption. In terms of the FTC, as I told Your Honor earlier, the United States versus Philip Morris, look at Note 7. They specifically said they need help. In this case, Mr. Peeler, he did go to Congress. He tried to get Congress to switch this to the FDA because they needed help. Got no response. He went to Donna Shalala at Health and Human Services asking for help. They're accountants. They're lawyers. They're economists. They're not doctors. They're not specialists. They're over their head. And in particular, they got no help from HEW. They left it to the states, just like Spreetsma. This was left to the states. There's a strong presumption against preemption. And that's what Chip Malone said. That's what Medtronic versus Lohr said. The only time that isn't true would be like in the Geier case, where in Geier, Congress set out two alternatives. You can use an airbag or you can use the seat belt and harness belt, the shoulder harness. And in particular, when the plaintiff sued, they said, listen, we regulated that specifically and we gave choices. Now we're not going to let you sue because they decided to use the other one, the other method. They didn't want to use an airbag, even though maybe airbags are safer. They said we specifically regulate. In this case, there was absolutely no regulation that was passed by the FTC. In fact, the FTC has said we need help. Congress never responded with help. The Donna Shalala never responded. HEW never responded. They left this up to the state. The strong presumption should ride in this case. In respect to the statute of limitations, I believe we agreed. The Hermitage case applies. This court decided Hermitage. It's a discovery rule. There's no way that the plaintiffs in this class could have possibly known about compensation. Compensation is an unconscious act that they were somehow knew or should have known their injury 
injured, and that injury came from wrongful conduct. Because no one knew. Dr. Burns, even the people of Philip Morris, Mr. Coleman, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Melheiser, everyone testified on their own. They didn't know about compensation until 1998, 1999 at the earliest. No one knew about this particular product being designed to dupe the FTC, to dupe the public, to dupe the doctors, to dupe the public health community. At the earliest, at the earliest, would have been the release of the 33 million documents in late 1999. And for that reason, Your Honor, I'd ask that you affirm the judgment below. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your time has expired. 